Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the structure that's sitting inside all of your heads. In some of you, it's allowing you to listen to me, and in some of you, it's allowing you to completely zone out, check your phone, wonder when Ranvijay is going to come back. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the brain and my work on it. The brain is a fascinating structure, and I look at depression in the brain. But really, that's not what most of my friends and family ask me about. Their biggest question is this. What does it mean for a mouse to be depressed? Why are we studying depression in an animal that is removed from us by millions of years of evolution? Is a mouse worried that it's going to come to ISF, give a talk, and make a total fool of itself? Well, I don't know, but to understand the mouse better, we have to look at our own brains a little bit better. Over the last two decades, we've changed the ways in which we interact with each other and how we experience things. Technology has fundamentally altered how we perceive rewards and how we feel happy. You see, the brain is made up of neurons, which are little cells that talk to each other by releasing these molecules called neurotransmitters. Some of these, like serotonin and dopamine, are things you've all heard about. They're very popular today, and that's because they are what help us feel that sensation of reward. The first thing that most of you do when you wake up in the morning is open your phone, which is an instant source of reward. It's a source of gratification. It's making you feel better. It's giving you everything you wanted, and you don't have to get out of bed. But the thing is, serotonin and dopamine don't paint the entire picture. Depression is a complex disorder that involves so many different symptoms. So the way in which scientists study it is by breaking those down. So what I decided to do was study one such symptom, which is called anhedonia. Anhedonia literally means an inability to feel rewarded. It means you guys are going out and having fun with your friends, but you're not really having fun. You're not happy. You used to love playing tennis, but now it doesn't bring you any pleasure or joy. Anhedonia is a chronic symptom we see in depression, and that's exactly what we went out to study. And we wanted to know what happens in your brain when you feel this way. Now, I am the sort of person who doesn't believe that we should only focus on serotonin. Serotonin has been dominating this game, and everyone here already knows about it. So, what I decided to do was target one of its partners in crime. Just like a good policeman, this brain works through different affiliates. It has different associates. It has different networks. So what I decided to do was ask, who are serotonin's friends? Who are the people that help serotonin behave, or rather, help our brain function? You see, this is a serotonin neuron. And you can see that there are two colors of molecules in the bottom. One is blue and one is red. That's because about 20 years ago, we found that a single serotonin neuron doesn't just produce serotonin. It also has a secret friend of serotonin that is living in the same house, and that friend is called glutamate. Glutamate is another neurotransmitter, and it's not as commonly talked about when we talk about depression. So what we decided to ask was, what happens when you remove this friend from the picture? What happens when I have a mouse where there's no glutamate coming out, and we've removed this roommate of serotonin? How does serotonin function, and how does it affect anhedonia? To do this, we designed a task in mice. Oh, oh, sorry, no mind. Okay, here it is. To do this, we designed a task in mice. And you see, the thing is, when I want to study anhedonia in people, I will ask you, what do you like? Do you like hanging out with your friends? I can't really do that with a mouse. So what I did was look at what mice are rewarded by. When you live like a mouse, you spend your entire day in a dull cage, eating the same boring food for meals. And that's why what we decided to do was give them milkshake. It gives them a sugar rush, and they absolutely love it. So what we did was we trained mice so that they learn that if they put their nose in one of these two yellow holes that you see, they'll get a bit of milkshake. And the thing about this is that when you feel rewarded by the milkshake, you'll go on doing this, and you'll get better and better at it. But if you're a mouse who doesn't feel rewarded by the milkshake, you'll say, eh, I'm not getting out of bed for this. And you won't really do well on this task. So when we looked at the performance of mice on this task, initially they were pretty similar. But then as we looked at it over time, there was one group that did better, and the other group did not perform very well. When we removed this glutamate from serotonin neurons, when we removed serotonin's best friend from living with it, these mice did not feel rewarded by the milkshake. 
And that's why they couldn't learn this task as easily. In this situation of anhedonia, we learn that drugs need not just necessarily target serotonin, but we can start looking at alternative targets which are secretly working alongside serotonin to understand our symptoms better. Now, I've told you a lot about mice, so don't take my word for it, because depression has been beautifully described, not just by doctors and scientists, but by artists, philosophers, patients, and poets, each of whom has said something beautiful about it and important. So the next time you hear about depression, maybe you'll realize that not all answers have to lie in ourselves. Thank you very much. OK, your questions. Really a lot of um, so I've seen uh, depressed mice, I've uh, seen hedonistic dogs, I've seen depressed snakes and hedonistic birds. What makes us us? What makes you you a human being? It's that the way depression works in us is, I mean, I don't, I think the way it works in us is a lot more profound compared to how it works in hedonistic mice, for certain. Dogs are a little more evolved, so definitely you will see a greater increase in, in the complexity. But I think if a human is depressed, you can see it in an artwork. You may not necessarily see it in their behavior, but you can see their art degenerating with time, representing how they feel. You can see them compose music that reflects how they feel, and you feel sad listening to those songs. Um, and I think that representation is only possible because our brains are at a level that we can't comprehend right now, at least. So many of us have that experience of, I, I can't get out of bed today. How would you uh, recommend that we get over that, or do we just accept it? I don't, uh, I have a lot of days and I can't get out of bed. <laughs> um, I definitely don't think you should just accept it. I mean, I will obviously always advocate to make change, to you know, um, seek out the necessary support mechanisms. But I also would like to acknowledge that not every place offers those support mechanisms. What I may get may be a result of my privilege and position, which not everyone else has access to. That's a really great um, uh, thesis that you have. Have you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It's sitting on my bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> there are two mice in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Do you know that? I don't think I remember, no. <laughs> in that, OK, the fun fact, the mice are the ones experimenting on the humans. And they're, uh, they're actually running on a treadmill Okay. in an experiment. Yeah. So the humans are running an experiment on the mice. But the mice are actually the ones observing the humans running the experiment. Right. Okay, so you have a like loop around Absolutely. that. So that's yeah. the fun part there. So what do you think about mice running on a treadmill? What and, do I think about that? And and its impact on this. Remember, I mean, we've talked about exercise and its impact on uh, serotonin and other yeah. depression or depression-like uh, phenomenon in our brains. Um, what, what's your idea of how that would all uh, impact with whether glutamate or serotonin? Um, I don't, so I think, yes, exercise of course impacts and it's obviously been proven to Im improve symptoms of depression, but I don't think it's a linear link. It may not necessarily improve all the ways in which we've studied it. When we study it in a mouse, we're doing a very specific manipulation. I'm stressing it out, I'm messing with its genes, and not every manipulation that I've done can be re reverted or can be changed just by exercise. So I guess it would depend on how you change the life of the mouse. Uh, and I do absolutely recognize that they are more complex creatures than I'm making them out to be in this talk. And I'm very, very grateful for all of them who have made this study possible.